Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending today. Um, I'm Robin Ashford, and my friend and colleague Gloria Doherty are from George Fox University, and we're going to share today about our textbook affordability program and um, basically what's been taking place over the last three years and uh, some of the takeaways and what we were able to accomplish in the way of student savings and other things as far as student success and engaging faculty and so forth. Um, before we get started, I wanted to ask what brings you all here today? Where, what is your interest in OER and textbook affordability? And do some of you have a program already in place or are you thinking about it? And just anything you want to share about that at all, if you can give your name and where you're from and a little bit about why you're here. Start on the right here, my right, your left. <laughs> Um, so, like that, Idaho State University, we've, uh, I mean, we're talking about it, we've got an OER committee, uh, we're not really getting a lot of traction, we've been four or five months talking, um, did some small grants, and there's pockets, but we're, I mean, we're looking for ways to get a little more momentum, a little more excitement on the campus about, uh, you know, making it a bigger deal, and making it uh, more prevalent. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, same. same All right. Yeah. I'm Tim Berman from, from uh, Big Bend College. Um, we haven't had a wholesale focus on OER, but we have a lot of faculty who've adopted it on their own as we've presented in different parts of it over the years. Uh, so looking for something that's a little more solid that we can say, you know, this, this is where to go for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm Susan Thornhill from George Fox University. Thanks, Susanna. And Mm -hmm. That's not yeah. the way they're plugging it. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, they, they plug it in almost the opposite way. Inclusive access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's what that word means, yes. Great, thank you. I'm Dave Merrill from Clackamas Community College, South of Portland. And uh, well before the OER movement, I acquired the nickname in my department of the textbook curmudgeon because I became <laughs> so disgusted with the, what I can see as the corruption of the big textbook companies and stopped getting. Thank you. I'm uh, Ben from the University of Portland. And we're not uh, doing much with OER at the moment. It just kind of bubbles up in conversations that I tend to be kind of at the periphery of a lot. <clears throat> so I'd like to just kind of know more about it so that when it does come up, we can have a more informed voice from the technology kind of aspects uh, side of it. Also, we tend to get kind of, we're not doing something about it. Um, and there's like top hat or something like that will come in and go around us and start working with our faculty on OER. They have, so mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I'm Sarah Dixon, um, Board of Institute of Technology and Learning Science at Um I've been mostly in my role just um, trying to get faculty, trying to figure out what their perceptions are in the online realm. Um, and then I've partnered with the bookstore, who's currently in the bookstore at the moment. Um, and then our initiative for this next winter is to actually have some kind of Great. 
Thank you. All right. So, yeah, and um, feel free to jump in if you have a question. And if I don't see your hand, just speak up. Um, you know, we'll, we'll pause at a certain place and ask if you have anything you want to share anyway. But if something comes up, just make noise and I'll look up. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a timeline to start. So spring 2016, basically submitted, uh, Gloria and I worked together and submitted a proposal for our open textbook initiative. This was just um, innovation monies that were made available through our president's office and um, we received seed funding of $16,000 to start our open textbook initiative. So we immediately took 5,000 of that and joined the open textbook network. I don't know how many of you are aware or familiar with the open textbook network. This is auto forwarding. I can't get it to stop. Hold on one sec. I'll see if I can. No, oh, it wants to just keep going. Hmm. So I don't know if there's a way. Uh, talk faster. Talk faster. Yeah. yeah. Talk faster. yeah. I, I love that. I Do you want to pause it whenever it starts to go forward? I don't. There's okay. no pause. Okay. Yeah. This is when you don't get to use your computer. You know. <laughs> anyway, um, we uh, held our first faculty workshop. How many of you are familiar with the Open Textbook Network? Can you raise your hand if you've heard of them? Okay. So some have, some haven't. Um, the Open Textbook Library is a library of, there's over 600 campuses and universities affiliated who have joined who are members of this. And it basically is a library of open textbook resources that anyone from anywhere in the world can download and use those books for free uh, for their courses. So they're all open textbooks. So we did not go with an OER, strict OER initiative. We wanted, because we had limited funding, limited resources as far as people goes, we wanted to focus in on open textbooks exclusively. Also, because we received feedback from faculty about the quality of OER. So if you start looking at all of OER, you're talking literally millions of resources that are out there if you consider YouTube videos and everything else. So we really focused on open textbooks. And to begin with, very specifically, open textbooks available through the Open Textbook Network Library, um, which are vetted and have been created with a higher quality level. And so that's why we went with that. So OK, this next one here, textbook affordability. We moved right into a textbook affordability program shortly after we launched this initiative through the library. So basically, um, when we talk about um, open, when we talk about this initiative and textbook affordability program, we're talking about the dual strategy of library ebooks and open textbooks. That's where our savings come from. So we purchase unlimited simultaneous user library ebooks so that a course can use one ebook in the course and every student has access and every student at the university has access same time we feel like it, it's a good investment so we have half a million ebooks now at our institution small institution we're just 4,000 students and we have purposely really moved forward with library ebooks yes so the licensing on those uh, sometimes the licensing is for a year a term not usually lifetime necessarily. Right. Is that the case you I mean, or, or are you, is there some other arrangement you're dealing with? Yeah, we're, we're very aware of the license in the packages that we're, we're a part of as well. And then we're also purchasing individual ebooks whenever we can. And yeah, there are limitations on some of them. We have not run into problems. The one problem we've run into is Sometimes we want to buy an unlimited simultaneous user and it's only available as a three user or a one user. In that case, we, don't, we can't get it because it's so, just... So are you buying those books that on availability or are there specific faculty asking for a, a book for their course that you're going after? Both. So if a faculty asks for a book for a course, we absolutely go in and try to buy that book. And we'll pay a fair amount if it's something that's going to be used in a course. So, and, and if, if you're familiar with library ebooks, they can be, you can spend as low as $20 to as much as several hundreds of dollars. So, I think the most I've spent is $400, but unlimited simultaneous users, even if it's one course, it's worth it. Yes. So, it's your library? 
Yes. I'm sorry. Supporting it. Yes, yes. This is actually our funding now is we're no longer grant funded. It's now due to the return on the investment that we've seen. It's now line item in the That's library budget. <laughs> yes. Kind of yeah, yeah. Well, and we're using some collection development funds as well. So yeah. So good, good questions. Yes. Yeah. It is 5,000 one-time uh, fee to become a member. That allows your faculty to be able to publish their reviews there. We have over 40 faculty reviews now after three years that have been published. So it's public scholarship. It gets them in there looking over their uh, content and they write a review and publish it. Then they decide if they want to adopt that book or not. Or in some cases, we've had faculty who've actually decided to author their own and publish that in there. We'll get a little more into that as we go. Great questions. Um, so this is our second year. Uh, 2017 to 18 was our second year. And got some numbers there <laughs> um, uh, that show you kind of the progression. Um, I've also got several links in these slides, so where we've documented all of this. So if you're really interested, you'll have access to the slides and the links that have the numbers. And, um, but you can see that we were able really after that, by, by the beginning of 2018, between the library ebooks and the open textbooks of savings was 315,000 student savings. And by the end of 2018, because this really, the momentum began to really build at our university, we had $800,000 in student savings just from 2016 to 2018 there. So year three, um, we did surpass already $1 million in student savings, and now we are no longer grant funded, but it is um, a line item in the library budget. Um, so it's been quite the progression, and there is a lot that took place. We've documented through library blog posts each of the different steps. There's actually four of them in there, and there's a link here to our page for faculty about the library textbook affordability program as well. Um, so in February 2019, we had our preliminary results, um, which we presented at um, ELI, and that presentation is available in our institutional repository, and it includes um, the strategy, very specific strategy pieces in there, and just exactly what we did, what we didn't do, what, um, what worked, and so forth. So if you're really interested in what was that exact strategy, this gives you a lot of that information step by step. Um, Could I ask you yes. Question? Do you mind if we ask No, questions? no, yeah. questions are great. Yeah. Um, so are you, so in the o OPM, um, I mean, there's a lot of books there. Did you guys, did, did the library just say, okay, we're going to put all of these in our reserves, or, or, or and then faculty could see that and start picking from there, or how, what yeah. were some of the mechanics? Okay, of that? great. I mean, they could go to OPM and pick their own text. Yes. But it sounds like you guys might have just made them more visible through the library to all the faculty. It, it's really about workshops. So, um, so. When you join the OTN, they do provide part of that 5,000 is they send two people to your campus where one is a faculty member at another institution um, who present on this to a group of faculty, faculty who have signed up. And so they come and attend and they get this presentation and then faculty can decide if they would like to review a book. They get the steps on what's involved with reviewing, what needs to happen, and they're told that stipend dollars are available through the library for this, uh, for those who are interested. The next step is the library takes that over. Gloria and I take that over in that we offer those workshops. One of the things we found out was that the workshop, the very first one, was on one day Faculty had to make sure they were available that day. We didn't have a huge number. I think there were 12 that were able to make it. Others were in classes. There were lots of reasons why they couldn't. So when we began to take it over, we offered like eight different sessions at different times. So faculty now attend a 30-minute workshop 
where what I call is an information session, where they come in and I have slides that I've created where I explain to them what this is about, what they need to do if they want to participate, what they get, and how they go about it. They get all that information in 30 minutes, and there's a set of slides that I share with them afterward. Then, then the faculty can decide if they would like help. I show them the Open Textbook Library, how they can find things in their topic, and if they'd like help, to simply email me and I'll help them and send them links as well. So it's really about, you know, we're available, here it is, take a look, and going from there. Um, so does that help with some of the, and, and the, the, the things are not, the Open Textbook Library is its own, its own um, you know, place online where people find these. Some of the books, I don't know if, how many of you are uh, aware of OpenStax, all of the OpenStax, which are high quality textbooks, mostly gen ed, they're all in the open textbook library. So any, any book that meets their criteria basically can be added there. It needs to be an actual textbook. So they have certain criteria when you send that. Yeah, I think you answered my question. I was wondering if you somehow brought the, these, this library into your own offering, but you really just, just through workshop, you refer them to, yes. to what exists, and if they, if they see a book and they want to pick it, you help them figure out how right. to get that into it. And they must first review a book before they can adopt it yeah. to be a part. They can on their own, but if they want the stipend dollars, they must first review a book. So they go in and look at that book that they're interested in using, write a review, it's published, and then if they say, I'm going to adopt this for my course, it's got to replace an existing textbook that costs students money, and then they get an additional $500 stipend as well as a $200 stipend for their, um, for their review. So, and on top of that, we now have three titles that have been authored by our faculty. So, this is another whole side. This is a, um, something that takes a lot of time and resources. Gloria is the main person here that works with a tool called Pressbooks that we've adopted at George Fox that creates um, a textbook and allows it to be exported in various formats. So, it gives us a digital PDF, a print PDF, a Mobi file, an EPUB, and an online uh, version. So you have these books now available in all those formats. It really helps. Gloria is our director of digital learning, so she is already an expert in all things digital, and it really helps to have someone like that. Pressbook is somewhat user-friendly if you're not doing things that are very complicated, but it can be take a little more expertise if you've got a lot of tables and things involved in those books. So a couple of our books were fairly straightforward. Our newest one, Trauma-Informed School Practices, has a lot of um, uh, tables and so forth, and that was a lot more involved. But um, it's been great, and our materials are now in the Open Textbook Library as well, and they're being used and downloaded every single day by people all over the world. And um, faculty have seen that, and they are thrilled by that. And now lots of faculty think they would like to author a book as well. And um, it's not as, you know, it can sound exciting, um, but there's a lot involved with it. Do you want to? Yeah, I can. Yeah. So you want to One of the things that we realize is we've already demonstrated how students can save money, but the really big question is what does it do to increase their success as a learner? I, and this is very hard data to come by to really quantify. We would like to offer anecdotally one thing that is significant and is verifiable, and that is the story of the second textbook that was authored. You, if, we, if this will play, and we will all hope that that will play in a moment, uh, you are going to hear the story of the faculty member on the right and his TA on the left who guided students in uh, being collaborators to author an actual textbook as budding experts. And so now they are published in the Open Textbook Library. So we'll let them tell the story. Yeah. And these are grad students. This is a seminary program. And um, that's a professor and uh, one of his graduates. Hi, my name is DJ Gupta, and I am Associate Professor of New Testament at Portland Seminary, which is a part of George Fox University. 
and I'm Jonah Sanford. I'm a recent graduate of Portland Seminary. I just completed my Master's uh, of Arts and Theological Studies there. We just want to talk for a few minutes about uh, a project that we did, uh, a Greek textbook, a collaborative project with eight students and Jonah and myself. And we were really eager to turn this into an open textbook and to involve students in this project. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the project, sharing with you what we did. So the idea came from hearing about what George Fox University, especially the library team, was doing in terms of investing in e-textbooks, wanting to bring down the cost of textbooks for uh, students, end users, people around the world. And combining that with a, a redesign at the seminary to focus on students not just doing assignments like papers, but producing things that are going to give them expertise in a particular area and maybe be a part of a portfolio, something physical or something tangible or something that will have an afterlife outside of the course. And so this was just kind of a mix between the library wanting faculty to invest in ebooks and a desire on the faculty end of basically learning by doing with students. So I knew that I was going to teach a course that was an advanced language course. And typically what you do is you just kind of learn from a book. And I thought, uh, what if we get the eight students involved with this project to come together? And um, this is a hybrid course, which means some students live locally, some students live at a distance. And we do a lot of work through uh, Zoom, through um, the course website, and also potential to do things through Google Docs. So, uh, you know, I had the idea that what if we use Google Docs and we had each student every week uh, contribute a portion to this textbook. First, they learn the material from books. We have guest speakers via Zoom from myself. And then we just start little by little putting it together. So we did it on Google Docs. I had each student write in a different color. So one student was blue, another student purple, another student green. And we would um, just have them write each week. And we'd also have them check each other's work. They knew enough to know how to do that. And we had this master plan that over a period of two terms, uh, about 25 weeks, um, that we would build a textbook. It's not super long. It's maybe 150 pages or something like that but something that would be really usable. We knew we wanted help, so we brought in Jonah as a co-editor because he had taken Greek, he'd done advanced work, and he knew how to really um, analyze the material well and make sure it was, was good. Yeah, so, so my role was more of an editor's role. I, um, I acted in a way as a sort of intermediary um, where the students could come to me with some of their nuts and bolts questions and. And uh, Dr. Gupta weighed in as well, but I, I got to interact with them in the Google Doc and um, refine their wording when necessary and, and just comb over everything um, and even contribute some material where I thought maybe, maybe they'd benefit from having an additional note on this or some aspect of whatever, whatever verse we were on at the time. Um, I, think, I think for me the most challenging part was really thinking about uh, putting myself back into the place of an intermediate Greek student um, and thinking, is this worded in a way that's, that's really accessible to an intermediate Greek student? Someone who's just finished their first year and is getting into a text for the first time. Um, so just making sure the notes reflected that, that perspective. Of, You're talking about the end user, the reader. Yeah, the, the reader we had in mind. Um, I think I think the most beneficial part of it for me, uh, and this is something that, that you talked about, Dr. Gupta, um, was that we were we were doing something very concrete. Um, in the seminary experience, you're doing a lot of quizzes and tests and even exegetical papers, um, but this was different because uh, the end result was something that was was a real contribution to the field. And it was something that we knew that other people were going to be able to use and benefit from. Um, and so it was very, it was a very concrete thing in that regard. Um, and, 
and it caused, I think it caused all of us to think about the assignment in a way that wasn't just academic, but we also had to think of it in a pedagogical sense. Um, so, so we had to step into a teacher's role and um, think how well are we communicating this and I really go over how accurately we're communicating everything and um, you know doing everything that we could do to make it the best teaching tool that we could. Hi, my name is DJ Gupta, and I am Associate Professor of New Testament at... Well, I think it'll... It may, you know. there we okay, go. okay. And you, you want to share that? Sure. I, one thing that I wanted to reiterate in that is you are hearing project-based learning, real-world outcomes, meeting publication. So we were really excited about that. So we wanted to open this up uh, to have you... Uh, share a little bit about your observations on textbook affordability uh, beyond what we shared earlier. Have you heard some things in this conversation that make you ask more questions or make you take a step toward an action? That, um, and we won't bother to log into any polling system. We're, we're an intimate group that can talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, anything to share so far? How do we get that? So if anyone else has anything to share, that's fine, or we can just move on. I've got a few lessons learned, a couple challenges and benefits that we wanted to touch base on, but you can see um, the lessons learned right here. Um, these were some things that we were really like pretty unexpected for, a lot, for in a lot of these. We were just like, oh, we hadn't even thought that that might happen when we were designing how this was going to all work. Um, we were really taken aback by um, more faculty being interested in authoring than we expected. Right from the start, we had faculty that, that just sounded appealing. And there, there is a stipend available, but it wasn't about the stipend for that. It was really about the idea of, well, I know a lot about this topic, and I think I could write a textbook. Um, and so, and they were, I think, excited about the idea that they could put something out there and make it available to others from around the world and about being heard and having a voice. I think it was a lot of it was about that, even for our faculty. Um, we also found that new faculty, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean that. That's all right. Um, so can you take us a little bit through the process so a faculty member, besides they, you know, they heard about it and they want to learn more about it, where do they go? On your campus, where do they go? Who do they contact? Yeah. How does that process end? Right. So it's really about, in the beginning, it's about they attend an information session. And again, we were fortunate that we had a provost who was very much behind this and very, very supportive. So she would send out the notice to all the faculty that there's a workshop being held and that there were several workshops. I would use a Google form and I would have all the dates on there and give them a choice of eight different dates to choose and even an other where if none of those worked, I'd be willing to meet with them one-on-one -on -one or in Zoom. You know, it's a 30-minute session. I could make that work and I had a fair amount of flexibility around that. 
So um, she would send that out and just her, it's the provost, you know, and we're small enough. It meant something that she was sending that to them. We, we had no problem then getting people to sign up. And I would meet, many of them were groups of three to five, no more than five most of the time in a group. Gloria and I would meet with them. I'd go through the slides and do a 30 minute presentation, say who's interested in reviewing a book and possibly adopting. They would contact me afterward if they were interested in that. And then they had already learned about the steps in those slides or steps that they had to be willing to go through. And it just, it worked amazingly well, really, you know, I mean, some would leave and say, no, there's, I, I think the number one issue was that there were not every topic is not covered. Every subject of book is not in the open textbook library. Um, gen ed though, it's fabulous. So biology, chemistry, math, um, English, all the main gen ed courses, it, everything is there because OpenStax has done a great job and they're high, high quality resources that are available through them. So for gen ed, I, I don't understand why every gen ed program doesn't use an open textbook. Costs nothing and they're, they're as good or better than what's already being used. Yes. Well, I would just follow that up. I think that uh, this black bullet you've got there, faculty buying from company and other places, we, we, we have really tried to push the gen eds. Those are high enrollment, yes. you know, big bang for the buck kinds of things and have not gotten the traction. I, I think the idea that we just need to open it up and let whomever is willing to do it. And then hopefully some of these bigger bang, you know, bang for the buck kind of right. courses come along as well. But right. Opening we it up. a lot of those gen ed faculty that have really been excited about being told this yes. is your choice for textbooks. Right, right. Mean, right. right. And uh, we never present it that way. We just say this is available, this is here. And we do do charts showing the cost of textbooks and showing the inflation rate and all sorts of numbers in the beginning of these presentations that are given. So they do see that. And they're coming because they're already aware that higher ed and the costs are, it's an issue. They're, they already know about that. So, um, and something you said, learning what faculty are already doing, that top, we actually just lucked out on this one. So it turned out that um, there was a faculty conference where I kind of introduced faculty to this whole grant that we'd received and that they would be uh, able to come and attend a workshop. There was a faculty member in that room, department chair for chemistry, and they had just decided to adopt the OpenStax chemistry book, which before I even talked to them, they had, he texted me in the middle of my talking, and he said, we just adopted the OpenStax chemistry book for the entire department of chemistry. He had 186 students that fall term taking that class, they went from a $260 book to a $0 book. So that was immediately 47,000 and some change dollars in student savings immediately. And that really was great because it helped us to be able to point to, uh, tell other faculty, this was a well-respected faculty member who's been there for a long time. And his entire department, because they made a decision as a department to do that, him as the chair especially, and they all followed suit. So every course, now some in some situations you might have a faculty member who says, you know, academic freedom, I'm not going to. But in, in many cases, when it's a departmental decision, I think there were four or five faculty members teaching chemistry, they all agreed that it was a good move and they did it and it was huge. And we've had since then a brand new faculty, so I mentioned new faculty are open and willing in there. We, had a, we do this digital fluency workshop in the beginning for new faculty, and they're introduced. They don't get a full uh, summary of the, the whole thing, but they're introduced to open textbooks and hearing about that and that there'll be uh, information sessions later. We had a brand new faculty member in our communications, which is a required course for every freshman, who looked at that and contacted me and said, well, I'm interested in changing this, it was like a $111 textbook to a free open textbook. And it wasn't OpenStax, but it was a book that's been around. It's got a great reputation. 
She did it in the entire department. This is a brand new faculty, and her entire department followed suit. And now we've got another, and we just went to our third full department, which is psychology now, that is now following suit with an introduction to psychology. So it just takes one, you know, that might say, you know, and then suddenly they're hearing like the president touts this and the vice presidents and, you know, they're hearing this is a good thing and, you know, it wouldn't be that hard. And the, the money that they get for adopting, you know, it's not a lot, but the $700, $200 to review and $500, each faculty member in chemistry went ahead and wrote a review and those reviews are really valuable and adopted, so they all got $700. It's not, you know, they might argue, well, that it's really not about that money. It's about acknowledging that there is a time commitment and a course redesign that takes place that's, you know, we're just saying thank you for doing that and here's this little something. So I hope that, that helped. Um, there are some benefits here that we listed. Um, some of you are probably aware of the five R's. But the collaborative opportunities, with the, the very obvious benefit and why we started this was just to help with the reduction in the cost of attending college. And that academic success thing, you know, people sometimes say to me, what do you mean by that? Well, you saw what was happening with those students in the seminary. But even in the other courses, even in a, just a gen ed course, one of the things you'll hear is that basically students can't learn from books they can't afford to purchase, right? So. If they can't afford the book, they're not going to succeed in that class. And sometimes, you know, they're using an older edition or they're waiting for money to buy the book later. Now they're two weeks behind. You know, it causes all sorts of problems. So the being able to, to do that. And then we have students who are incredibly grateful. I, I am really taken aback sometimes when students hear um, that I recently, a group of students heard that you know, I was part of who is behind the, and they're like, you're why we didn't have to buy that book. We love you. So I mean, they're just like <laughs> ecstatic over it, like way beyond it seemed like, you know. Do you have, have you checked any retention rates in some of these classes? Has, has, has the retention rate gone up in any of this stuff where, where the students are engaged from day one or, or have access to things day one? Uh, is that help in retention? Do we have any data about that? Yeah, there's research being done now. Um, there's a whole group. Um, in our institution, I have that under the challenge of assessment. So these are some of the challenges. And at our institution, assessing this is problematic at this point. But there are a whole group of open ed researchers who are looking at this at different institutions. Uh, Brigham Young University has a large group of folks that are working on the research all around open education, open textbooks, open educational resources. And that's one of the things they're starting different. Some of the larger groups, I would say, are really starting to look at that whole thing, the retention. And there is a report that came out the end of 2018, and I have a guide that has all the research that's been published and is being published on this, uh, where you can go and click on those links and see. But the one piece that came out the end of 2016 had to do with the rate of D, Ds, Fs, and withdrawals, DFW it's called, and how that has gone down in some of these places where they really looked at the numbers and assessed what's happening here. Is it making a difference? And they're finding that especially with marginalized populations, it's really making a difference. So that research study is linked in one of those um, guides here as well. So yeah, these are some of the challenges and um, it is a challenge. Um, like the time commitment, so we didn't have money to hire someone. So this is like, we're looking at things all the time of like, what can we do to make this doable? Um, we do have a shift in focus for 2019-20, um, where we're kind of working with departments who have expressed strong interests. So we have a department of professional studies that is really working on a very specific project and um, the new faculty piece, and I would like to show, this is a two minute video. Let's see if we can get this to play, and I think we're close to ending here. This might be it, yes. 
So we'll, we'll end on this and what's happening here, because you'll hear about this in some um, even community colleges. My name is Dr. Jenny Harrop. I am chair of the Department of Professional Studies at George Fox University. Our department houses the degree completion program for the university. We have about 300 students, about 55 faculty, 50 or so of those are adjunct faculty in our department. Since fall of 2016, we have been pushing hard for all faculty to turn all courses over to e-resources or open textbooks of some kind. In 2017, we started an initiative that we call 20 by 2020. The first 20 is dollar signs, the next 2020, that's the year 2020. So our goal is to see the price point for textbooks in every course that we offer at $20 or less by the year 2020. We're on track, not positive we're gonna make it, but could be by December of 2020 that we do. Um, in our GE offerings, general elective courses, we offer about 50 different courses and we're down to only four or five remaining that still have traditional textbooks in use. Some of it is faculty resistance at times. They're simply not aware of what's out there. So it's taken a lot of undergirding help from our reference librarians, help from other people around the university to encourage them and show them what is out there. I had the privilege in 2017 of writing the first open textbook for George Fox University. It was published in January 2018. And for me, it was not a difficult venture. This is a writing philosophy that I've taught in my classroom since the early 1990s. So it was a pleasure to put my fingers to the keyboard and simply write out what I've been teaching for, for decades now. Uh, the book is titled The Simple Math of Writing Well, Writing for the 21st Century. And it's been a pleasure to be able to include the link on every syllabus in every class that we teach in our department. It's a basic writing resource um, geared for the 21st century, geared for the student who has to write in nearly everything that they do in a way that wasn't required in the 20th century. So to have it as an open textbook makes a lot of sense. It's been nice for me with colleagues to be able to send them the link anywhere in the world and they can access it and see my work and use it in their courses as well. So, um, yeah, that um, pretty much concludes our presentation. Um, so questions, thoughts, um, I have that guide, a link to that guide at the end there. That has everything, every post, every, the research I talked about. There's a whole page, it's just on the research. Um, we have a page in that guide that's called Faculty Champions, and it's where I list each faculty member who's written a review and a link directly to the book that they reviewed, where you can read their review. So, um, and that, that's ongoing, something that I just keep building and adding new research to, and it's got our presentations, and even the presentations, the information sessions for year one, year two, and year three, that I give those 30 minute sessions to faculty so you can see how that has evolved. So, um, questions, thoughts, comments, suggestions? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and the, the, I'm glad you mentioned that because many of these books are available in print. So all of the OpenStax books, if a student wanted to purchase it in print, like that chemistry book, which is a over 1,000 pages, it's a robust chemistry textbook, the OpenStax makes theirs available in print at pretty much cost, very close to cost. It is a $60 hardcover book. Um, that you buy through their channel on Amazon, but it is a, um, you know, it's a huge book, and some of them are $25. It really has to do with the size and number of pages and so forth. Um, but as far as reading on digital devices, um, in the library, because of the eBooks especially, um, lots of folks are using iPads for reading those, and I do work one-on-one -on -one with students who have questions partly about downloading that book onto their iPad, how to open it in an app, or what else they can do with that. And I, I actually spend a lot of time now showing them how they can download it as a PDF 
uh, like to keep forever, even though a lot of them are DRM protected. They're not all DRM protected. And most of our books, we use a company called ProQuest. Um, they, they allow a certain amount every 24 hours to be downloaded to keep. So I walk people through that process. Also in my library research classes, when I go into a classroom, they're using those books in the classroom for their course. I give them a tutorial on how that works. So that helps some. But I know, you know, different people have an aversion to the online reading and preferred it in print. So whenever possible, our books are all available in print, the ones that our faculty have adopted. They're available in print as well as freely available online. So it's just up to the student. Is that? Great. Are we about done or do we have any further questions? Glad to answer questions if you have interest. And also, feel free to email us. Um, we're glad to answer, and I usually do get email questions from time to time. And we're glad to just you know, answer anything that comes up. We're still learning. We don't have all the answers. There's lots to learn. There's more that we're considering all the time, what else we could do, how to make it more sustainable. So the sustainability piece is, um, pretty critical and it, it does we got one of the things we really want to just emphasize is that it doesn't take a whole lot to get started you know it we didn't have a lot of funding and even now there's not a lot of funding it's really just these stipends to encourage faculty to take a look at this you know and then I think more and more now we're riding on that momentum so I would say don't be discouraged when you were talking about how to get that it really just takes one faculty member to really buy in and so I yeah I just would open it up like you said just open it up and see if someone comes who's interested and then does it and then has a great result from that so, good Thank you. Okay. we're good we hit that I'm not sure why it went into auto advance. And when I looked at the setting, it didn't show a place to turn it off. I know. It was, I, it's not I, a Mac. <laughs> Do you get, does your library have an OER reader? An OER? Oh, or an OCR. Sorry, an OCR. OCR. Um, they, they have it built into two of our major yeah. printers and libraries. We invested in the software that went with the scanner. Gotcha. So now they just push a button. And they scan, and it sends the print version to their email. Yeah, yeah. So that's nice. Yeah, it's you know it's it still has issues depending on what the original was like. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, but yeah, the acronym O E R O C R. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We put that in the, each of our libraries, <laughs> that's all right. both campuses have access for our faculty and students. Okay. Yeah. You guys take over. Thank you. Sorry. We never saw anyone, so no one came. So we just pulled up what we had in the Just sort of start recording. Well, no idea. Usually, yeah. some gentleman yeah. that comes and sets okay. it up because they use a special tool that we don't, we didn't have. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to close out of this. Yes, thank you. Anything private. <laughs> you have a remote? How do we blank? This, oh, this, there's a box um, on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it's covering those things as well as it's hmm. Do you know what's what? I have no idea. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. So, but yeah, anyone can. See forward and back. Yeah. I don't mind yeah. handing you a space bar. <laughs> yeah. No, it's. I was just trying to see how to blank the screen. Yeah. Um, I don't care. It doesn't really matter. But. Is this on? Oh, it's, it wasn't on. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And where is Washington? Uh, no, I'm struggling with the college. One of the college in Washington. I'm thinking at the projector. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So it's I'm not, not an expert at least. I'm doing anything. Right? There's a connect button on the hmm. Maybe the battery's dead. If we see someone, we can know that other one. Let's see. Um, is this the right mode? Or do you want, let's see, is there a mode that has notes, that shows the notes? Do you prefer the um, I, Yeah, no, I wouldn't have shown the notes. Okay. I mean, not to display the notes there, but only for the... Oh, I don't, I don't, need, I don't need the notes. Good. All right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's good. And the uh, the links work. The, um, the the animation should work with the space bar. So. Yeah. Yeah. It worked with. Uh, let's see. Uh, with the arrow keys. With the arrow keys. Okay. But let's see. Here's a here. Okay. So there, I do have to hit. <clears throat> that one's animated as well. And then the port, yeah, or the arrow keys. Good. Yeah, so I missed that one. <laughs> better. So there's really no reason to. This is for later, for yeah. them later. Uh, well, I could. Did you want to pull up the. I can um, pull it out just to show them. Did you want to pull up the um, workshop? Uh, yeah, yeah, let me do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, I don't think we'll talk them through it extensively, but if, if anybody asks, <laughs> I think we can just use the PowerPoint. <laughs> Trackpad set up opposite of mine, so I'm going, going up and down the wrong way. <laughs>
the new this new account. That works fine, but that's just student access, so I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna log in the other way. Well, we've got four. <laughs> yeah. If they if they plan to stay. <laughs> we'll cover a hold holdovers from the last session. Which one are we showing first? The, um, do we show do we show the workshop at all? Or is it mainly the template? No. We, don't really we don't I mean I don't think we need to get into the get template into unless anybody asks. I just thought we should have it there in case anybody asks. Otherwise we can just use the slideshow. Just yeah. keep it simple. Yeah, yeah. I think we can get into it later. If yeah, you want to exactly. see it, just, it's like nice to see the visual. Yeah. It's easier to look at than that one. I like that. Well, yeah, no, sure. Like Fair that. enough. Yeah, we, yeah. we can kind of, that yeah, makes we'll sense. See. So when we get to that section, I think I'm talking through it. So then we can, maybe you can yeah. get in there and just show a couple things. Right, okay. Good. And I made a note that you know, the schedule one that it was from your class, so I can imagine we talk about that together. Mm -hmm. Since, okay. You know, yeah. I mean, I'll talk about that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's mainly how it's set up, and, and that we have yeah, alternatives yeah. alternatives in the template that's as right. well. Yeah, you can talk about how that's yeah. going in your class. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Oh yes, yeah, so we lost Dave. He was here for the. The session before. Oh, he's, re he's from Clackamas. <laughs> uh, English faculty. Oh. From Clackamas. Okay. Actually, nice. really a good guy. I don't think I've met him. I mean, I saw him. Yeah. This is going to be a real round table, I think, then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyone here an expert with that? Well, we're we're competing against flowers <laughs> from the nation. Did you play the trailer yesterday? Yes. And then, <laughs> oh, we didn't do the trailer, so we're not surprised. But it's a round table, so we're definitely going. To